Now Mark Hitchcock will have 12 minutes for a rebuttal. Let me uh, begin with one of the last statements Mr. Hanegraaff made. You said Norm Geisler, who also is a preterist, I think you meant to probably say a futurist. I think you said Norm Geisler, who's a preterist. He, Norm Geisler is a futurist. Um, he said, uh, Norm Geisler wrote a, a very stinging uh, critique, it's available on the internet, of uh, Mr. Hanegraaff's, Hanegraaff's book, The Apocalypse Code. And I'm going to talk about this again a little bit later, but Mr. Uh, uh, Dr. Geisler says in his critique that uh, Mr. Hanegraaff misquoted him. Now, I'll let them figure out whether he was misquoted or not. That's an issue between them uh, to deal with. But in the article, uh, Norm Geisler says that he holds to the A.D. 95 date of Revelation, that he's held to it for 50 years. Mr. Hanegraaff just said that uh, Norm Geisler said that the late date makes no sense. So anyway, in his own critique, Norm Geisler says that he's held to the late date for 50 years. Um, is a statement uh, that he made. One of the things Mr. Hanegraaff brings up is the uh, milieu of the book of Revelation, the, what was going on at that time. Let's read a couple of statements here. Uh, S.R.F. Price says that it's in principle quite likely that the establishment of the cult of Domitian at Ephesus which involved the participation of the whole province is attested by a series of dedications by numerous cities led to unusually great pressure on the Christians for conformity. Uh, Greg Beale concludes the evidence of pressure from the imperial cult in Asia Minor supports the Domitianic date of Revelation that's lacking for a pre-70 date. Elizabeth uh, Schusler Ferenza says that under the Flavians, especially Domitian, the imperial cult was strongly promoted in the Roman provinces. Domitian demanded that the populace acclaim him as Lord and God, participate in his worship. The majority of the cities to which the prophetic messages of Revelation are addressed were dedicated to the promotion of the emperor cult. Such an environment, Christians were bound to experience increasing, con increasing conflicts with the imperial cult, especially since they claimed Jesus Christ and not the Roman emperor as their Lord and God. Revelation knows of harassment and persecutions of individual Christians in various localities. It anticipates an increase of persecutions and suffering for the near future, not least because of the increase, increasing totalitarianism of the reign of Domitian. So the book of Revelation and the emperor cult that Mr. Hanegraaff has mentioned uh, really fits better under Domitian than it actually does uh, under Nero. There was no systematic empire-wide persecution under either Nero or Domitian. But the uh, persecution of Nero never got outside, according to secular and Christian historians, the city and the environs of the city of Rome. A couple of other things. Mr. Hanegraaff mentions uh, Revelation 11, the temple that he believes must be intact at the time in Ezekiel 40 to 43, and how in uh, Ezekiel uh, an angel measures the temple, and in uh, Revelation chapter 11, you know, John measures the temple. To me, it doesn't matter who measures the temple. The point is, Ezekiel saw a temple that was future. It didn't exist at the time he wrote. The same thing with Daniel. In Daniel 9 and in Daniel 12, uh, he speaks of a temple and sacrifices, the sacrifices being offered and being stopped. Daniel is writing these statements almost 50 years after the Jerusalem temple has been destroyed. So he has to be talking about a future temple. And so if Daniel and Ezekiel both refer to future temples that are not existing when they're writing, we should ex expect John, who's often called by many people, you know, the New Testament counterpart to the book of Daniel, uh, to do the very same thing. Also, again, Mr. Hanegraaff, you say, you know, soon means soon, near means near. Again, the book of Revelation is framed by the words soon and near. They occur at the beginning of the book. They occur at the end of the book. They're like inclusios or bookends. Everything in the book is included within the meanings of those terms. So if you say that soon means soon and near means near, as in just a few years, how did the second coming and the great white throne occur soon or near? These are events that haven't occurred yet. So whatever meaning you give to these terms, it incorporates the whole book. It's Revelation 1-3, and in Revelation uh, chapter 22, uh, these terms are used. Again, my view of those words is that they speak of eminency. Uh, the Lord says, or Paul says in uh, Romans 15, you know, the Lord will soon crush Satan under your feet. Um, Philippians 4-5 says the Lord is near. These are statements of eminency.
These are statements that these events could take place at any time, which, by the way, is a great encouragement to the people of God in every generation. Every generation that has come along reads those words, the time is near, the time is at hand, and we are encouraged by those to believe that God can break in at any time and uh, bring the great deliverance that's promised. Um, another thing is, is uh, Mr. Hanegraaff talks about how the, the, the final authority is the Bible and not all these people from church history. If you read any New Testament introduction by Raymond Brown, Donald Guthrie, the best known New Testament introductions you can find, every book in the New Testament is dated by external and internal evidence. Both of those are relevant. It's not an either or. Now, the Bible is the final authority. And you've mentioned how we shouldn't listen to Eusebius because he uh, says that John was not the author uh, of the book of Revelation. Um, it's interesting, um, in your book, The Da Vinci Code, uh, Fact or Fiction, the Bible Answer Book, Volume 2, in your book, The Resurrection, you quote Eusebius and Irenaeus uh, over and over again for uh, fact, facts from uh, the early church, like how uh, the, uh, 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 James, the half-brother of Jesus, uh, his method of death, um, how Peter uh, was crucified upside down, um, you mentioned in your book, uh, Da Vinci Code, Fact or Fiction, uh, you call Eusebius the first great church historian. Um, you talk about how Irenaeus and Eusebius shed light on New Testament accuracy. So if these men are good enough to shed light on how Peter was crucified and shed light on uh, how James, the half-brother of Jesus, died, and uh, to shed light on historical accuracy, and you even mentioned Eusebius as one that we can look to for uh, the establishment of the canon, then why aren't these men good enough to tell us when John wrote the book of Revelation? Uh, you can't cherry pick the sources and say in one case, well, they go against my view, so I'm not going to listen to what they say, but when they favor my view, then I'm going to take what they say. You can't do that. Uh, to me, it's against the, the tenets of logic and, and fairness and uh, scholarship. Uh, we'll talk about that more in a little bit later. But also, this is a historical fact. The, the date of the book of Revelation that was passed down. This is not an interpretation of a scripture. You know, he says we wouldn't agree with the church fathers and a lot of their interpretations of scripture. This is a historical fact. It's not very hard to get right when somebody tells you that John wrote the book of Revelation, the end of Domitian's reign. Um, and to pass that down and, and to have that as part uh, of the uh, belief of the early church. Um, another thing that uh, Mr. Hanegraaff mentioned again is he said that if uh, you know, John had written the book of Revelation in 95 AD, he would have mentioned this event. And it's inconceivable that he wouldn't have looked back and mentioned uh, AD 70. Again, Jesus told John specifically, write the things you've seen, which is the vision in chapter 1. Write the things that are, that's in the present tense, and the things that will take place after these things. He did not say, John, write the things that were. If John would have, in 95 A.D., written about these past events, then he would have been violating, it seems to me, the very direct command by Jesus himself of what he was to write. And I would agree with Mr. Hanegraaff that the uh, uh, statement of Jesus about the destruction of Jerusalem and the coming true of that statement is a great apologetic for the faith. But the book of Revelation is not an apologetics book. It's a prophecy says that in chapter 1, verse 3. says it in chapter 22, verse 7, and verse 10. At the beginning and at the end, this is a prophecy. It's not a history book. It's not an apologetics book. It's a prophecy. It's talking about the future uh, from the time that it was written. And one other thing, he mentions the seven kings in uh, Revelation 17. and says if you start counting with Julius Caesar, you have Julius Caesar, then you have Augustus, Tiberius, uh, then you have uh, Caligula, then Claudius, then Nero would be the sixth king. The problem is there's just as many people saying you ought to start the counting with Augustus as to begin it with, with Julius Caesar. And if you do it that way, then Nero's the fifth king, and it doesn't work. In fact, there are people who say that you ought to start the counting with Caligula, the mad uh, ruler Caligula. There, uh, David Owney, in his commentary on Revelation, lists nine alternate schemes for counting uh, these kings. My view is, I won't have time to go into this in detail, that these seven kings that are mentioned there are seven kingdoms. The reason I say that is, if you go back to Daniel 7, in Daniel chapter 7, 
It says that it uses the word kings in Daniel 7.23, but these seven kings, they're kingdoms. And so Daniel 7 being the backdrop for this, I take it that those seven kings there are kingdoms. Assyria, Egypt, uh, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece, five have fallen. One is when John is writing, that is the Roman Empire. And then there's one that's still to come, which will be the ultimate empire um, of the Antichrist uh, that's going to come and take place. So when I look uh, again at the evidence of the book of Revelation, I look at these luminaries from the early church. Again, the same people that Mr. Hanegraaff uses to prove all kinds of other points. These men tell us the book of Revelation was written in 95 AD. And it's not as if I just rely on external evidence. He says we ought to go to the Bible. I listed seven internal arguments that strongly suggest and in some cases necessitate a 95 date. The the decline in the seven churches that had taken place. The martyrdom of this man Antipas. And the other arguments that we listed. So I'm not either or. I'm not up here saying we just look at the external evidence and just make our decision based on that. But I think we look at both. We always do that uh, with New Testament books. And so what I believe is when you look and take both of these together, the external evidence outside the Scripture, again, this long line, I mean, Hegesippus, Irenaeus, the Vectorinus, Primaceus, Origen, Clement of Alexandria. When you look at what these men say, and then you compare that with what we see in the book of Revelation itself, the internal arguments then I think it's a strong case together. Both of these uh, point strongly toward uh, the AD 95 uh, date. And I think uh, the evidence that Mr. Hanegraaff has presented um, in no way carries the burden. It falls far short of any burden to carry the day that uh, the AD 65 date uh, is true by the preponderance of the evidence. All the weight that I see is on uh, the side of the AD 95 traditional date of Revelation. Thank you. Now, Mr. Hanegraaff has 12 minutes for, to rebut uh, Mr. Hitchcock. And if I called Norman Geisler a preterist, my apologies. Yes, I didn't think that I could slip that by anybody here. <laughs> I just want to make sure I'm correct on yeah. the tape, so thank yeah. you. Uh, Norm Geisler is not a preterist. He is a futurist. He is a dispensationalist. dispensationalist. Um, but as far as the statement that I read, let me reread it. If you and your fellow followers write accounts of Jesus after the temple and the city are destroyed in AD 70, aren't you going to at least mention that unprecedented national, human, economic, and religious tragedy somewhere in your writings, especially since the risen Jesus had predicted it? Of course. Now, this is not between him and me, as you suggest. All you have to do is get his book. It takes too much faith to be an atheist, and you can read Mm -hmm. uh, his long, lengthy Mm -hmm. apologetic in this regard. Uh, That book is available for anyone to read. We uh, we offer it at the Christian Research Institute. It's a great book. The evidence is in the book. This is not disputable. Um, Let me say a couple of things about the external witness. I'm not saying that external witness is not relevant but that the external witnesses need to be tested in light of Scripture, that the Scripture is the final court of arbitration. And I'm making an appeal to sola scriptura. That is the final court of arbitration. So I spend a whole lot less time exegeting the fathers than I do exegeting the Scriptures. But with respect to the fathers, let's talk about them for a moment. Hegesippus. I would say that Hegesippus requires interpretation, but on one point he is clear, and that is he's an exegetical eschatologist. He believes the Son of Man coming on clouds was fulfilled with the destruction of Jerusalem. Secondly, about Hegesippus we should say that he definitely requires a tremendous amount of interpretation. Hegesippus says that Jerusalem was destroyed at the death of James. Now, by the way, there are no Hegesippus writings extant. 
Uh, we get this information through Eusebius. But it's very clear through the words of Eusebius that Hegesippus says that James, the brother of Jesus, is thrown from the pinnacle of the temple and subsequently stoned. Now, he doesn't die when he falls from the temple, pinnacle evidently, and he doesn't die when he's subsequently stoned. Uh, he dies after he's being clubbed to death. But James, very clearly, is the brother of Jesus. And about James, Hegesippus says that when he died, Vespasian sacks the city. Now, if you read him in a wooden literal sense, that would mean that Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed in AD 62 at the death of James, not in AD 70. My point here is simply to say, Hegesippus requires interpretation. Irenaeus likewise requires interpretation. I don't only say that he was mistaken when he said uh, Jesus died at around 50 years of age or that he had a 15-year ministry. I do think he was mistaken, but that's not the only point. There are many points that could be made with respect to Irenaeus. Irenaeus thought Peter and Paul founded the church at Rome. How many of you think that Peter and Paul founded and organized the church at Rome? Read Romans chapter 1 or read Romans chapter 15. You'll know for certain that Paul did not organize and found the church at Rome. So Irenaeus was evidently wrong or requires some kind of interpretation. I stand with my statement that Irenaeus writes a markedly ambiguous sentence in his Against Heresies. And by the way, if you've ever taken the time to try to stumble through against heresies, particularly when Irenaeus is dealing with the Gnostics, good luck. He's very, very difficult to interpret or understand. Now, this markedly ambiguous statement is not just based on whether it was John or John's vision that was seen during the reign of Domitian. There are a lot of different possible interpretations. It could be that the, uh, the autographs themselves of Revelation were seen during the reign of Domitian. Uh, very possibly in context, and I spent the time reading this myself, uh, I'm not hanging my hat on this, but this is a possible interpretation. Uh, very possibly he was trying to identify and solidify the number of the beast, and therefore was saying during the reign of Domitian, the autographer was still extant, and that would settle the dispute. It could be that he was talking about Domitius, the birth name of Nero. There are a lot of possibilities, but we need to learn to recognize that he is not the final court of arbitration, and he did make a lot of mistakes, one of which I find personally egregious. He believed that demons could have sex with women. And he believed that this is the explanation that we should attach to Genesis chapter 6. My point here is simply to say, if Irenaeus is right, we lose epistemic warrant for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because if demons could materialize, produce bodies and fertile sperm and have sex with women, not only should we worry about that happening now, but if that were possible... Demons could have masqueraded as the resurrected Christ. And so when Christ said, a spirit does not have flesh and bone as you see that I have, it would have been a horribly inadequate explanation. Victorinus. If you take him at face value... John was in the mines on Patmos, experienced hard labor during the reign of Domitian when he was somewhere between 90 and 100 years old. And then, according to tradition, he carries on a fruitful ministry in Ephesus after he crosses the Aegean Sea. 
I think it's noteworthy that while Eusebius was a church historian, and we laud him as a church historian, and I'm not cherry-picking here, that's not my point, it's simply to say we test the fathers in light of Scripture. Do you think Eusebius was right? That John is not the author of Revelation? The church fathers require interpretation. Now, with respect to soon means soon and near means near, let me first say that I have been mischaracterized as a partial preterist. I don't use that system of interpreting Scripture. In fact, Dr. LaHaye has called me a full preterist. In fact, in the Dallas Morning News, there was a statement by Dr. LaHaye saying that Hank Hanegraaff believes that Jesus Christ came back in AD 68, which must surely be one of his most creative works of fiction. I have never said such a thing, and I remember going to a great big pastor's conference in Orlando with people waving the newspapers and saying, you're not coming to my church again. Absolutely false. I am not a full preterist, and I am not a partial preterist. Soon means soon, and near means near. And what I mean by that is simply this. Jesus is not linguistically challenged. He is using the language of the Old Testament prophets. He is the heir to the linguistic riches of the Old Testament prophets and a greater theologian than them all. And he's speaking in the manner of the Old Testament prophets. He's speaking about an apocalypse that is looming on the horizon and he's associating vindication for true Israel in this apocalypse with vindication in the eschaton. Each one of you even now knows that that is how the Old Testament prophets spoke. Why can't John speak that way? Again, this will be underscored uh, as the debate continues. Now, as far as starting with Augustus, as opposed to starting with Julius Caesar, the father, of the Roman Empire. Again, I want to be biblical here. I don't want to use a historical paradigm for setting the seven kings. I want to be biblical. And that is why I underscored in my opening remarks the fact that the Bible refers to kings as Caesar. And Caesar is the family name of Julius, which makes Julius Caesar the first Caesar. And I also augmented my comments by saying that Suetonius, Josephus, Dio Cassius, and the sibling oracles make the same point. Now, I spent a lot of time studying the Caesars because my daughter, Christina, who is 14, uh, loves Roman history. And so I've had to stay up with her. And I've spent a lot of time on this subject. And I Uh, think that from a biblical standpoint in particular, we are on safe ground to say that Julius Caesar was in fact, as the father of the Roman Empire, the first Caesar. It's his family name. Now again, I'm not arguing here for an either-or proposition. I'm not saying that the fathers are not relevant. I'm not saying that Uh, The fathers are not important, but where the fathers stray from Scripture, I stray from the fathers. I will never accept baptismal regeneration. I will never accept the perpetual virginity of Mary. And I will never demonize Jews as the fathers did in the centuries following uh, the death of Christ. When the Jews cried, His blood be on us and our children, it wasn't the children who were punished for the sins of the fathers. Each person is held culpable, at least biblically, for their own sins. Hank's first question for Mark is, in your co-authored book titled Extraterrestrials, you cite early church fathers such as Irenaeus as external evidence for your contention that fallen angels can materialize, take on human bodies, and have sex with women. 
For example, you cite the words of Justin Martyr, quote, the, angelic tra uh, the angels transgressed and were captivated by love for women and beget children, unquote, as evidence that demons not only have the wherewithal to have sex, but to impregnate women who in turn give birth to gi gigantic offspring. In like fashion, in late dating Revelation, you appeal to tradition of early church fathers such as Irenaeus, Justin Martyr, and Eusebius to late date the writing of the book of Revelation to the time of Domitian. While church fathers have certainly made noteworthy contributions, many of the early traditions, including baptismal regeneration, have had negative consequences. Irenaeus believed that Jesus died when he was nearly 50 years of age and Eusebius denied that Revelation was written by the Apostle John. Since the traditions such as demons materializing, having sex with women, and producing gigantic offspring make epistemic warrant for the resurrection and ultimately the deity of our Lord in traditions such as the, uh, those of Eusebius and Dionysus call into question the apostolic authorship and origin of the book of Revelation. Would it not be more circumspect to place greater Ex evidential weight on the internal evidence of the infallible text as opposed to external evidence based on fallible traditions? This is a question about the place really of external evidence in dating New Testament books. I have three responses. First in this question, Mr. Hanegraaff begins with Justin Martyr and his view of Genesis 6, which by the way has nothing to do with the date of Revelation. And then he says that I appeal to tradition of early church fathers such as Irenaeus, Justin Martyr, and Eusebius to late date the writing of the book of Revelation. However, I never mentioned Justin Martyr as evidence for the late date. Anyone who's familiar with the external evidence knows Justin Martyr did not deal with the date of Revelation as far as we know. This is an incorrect statement. It's a factual error. Uh, Mr. Hanegraaff had a copy of my dissertation for several months before he wrote these questions, and I don't appeal to Justin Martyr as he says. Second, both external and internal evidence are always used in dating New Testament books. Both are relevant. It's not either or. Again, read any New Testament introduction. As you've seen, I do not ignore the internal evidence. The internal evidence also proves the AD 95 date, but the overwhelming external evidence comes alongside and serves as powerful confirmation that our view of the internal evidence is correct. The reason Mr. Hanegraaff wants to discount the importance of the external evidence when it comes to the date of Revelation is that it goes strongly against his view. Now third, as I mentioned earlier, Mr. Hanegraaff frequently uses the very same sources he criticizes. In the Da Vinci Code Fact or Fiction, he appeals in a chapter that he wrote uh, to, Justin Mar uh, to uh, Irenaeus that he sheds light on the New Testament accuracy. In the same book, he calls Eusebius the first church historian that he gives abundant evidence that the canon was well established before the time of Constantine. Again, on page 62 of that book, he gives the tradition that Peter was crucified upside down, uh, and that Eusebius describes how James was, thrown, James was thrown from the pinnacle of the temple and subsequently stoned. In the Bible Answer Book, Volume 2, he quotes Irenaeus and Eusebius in support of New Testament historical accuracy. And twice in his book, Resurrection, he he cites Irenaeus and cites uh, Eusebius for historical facts. In his book, The Apocalypse Code, Mr. Hanegraaff questions the clarity and reliability of Irenaeus on page 153 concerning his testimony about the date of Revelation. Yet just 13 pages earlier on page 140, he cites Irenaeus approvingly as a source that the Apostle John was the author of the book of Revelation. If Irenaeus is good enough for Mr. Hanegraaff to use as a source for the authorship of Revelation, why isn't he a good source 13 pages later for when the book was written? Mr. Hanegraaff's blatant inconsistency is apparent. How can one legitimately use Irenaeus as a source for who wrote Revelation and then turn around 13 pages later and tear down the reliability of the very same witness concerning the date of Revelation? This is contrary to the basic tenets of logic, fairness, and scholarship. Mr. Hanegraaff uses external sources when they help his case, but then turns around and dismisses the very same sources as unnecessary or unreliable when they go against his view. This cherry-picking of sources to suit his own purposes undermines his method and his conclusion concerning the date of Revelation. Also, isn't it ironic that Mr. Hanegraaff's own argument goes against him here? He dismisses the testimony of Irenaeus because he made one mistake about the length of Jesus' ministry. Yet in this very question, Mr. Hanegraaff makes a factual error concerning Justin Martyr as a source for the date of Revelation. 
following Mr. Hanegraaff's own logic, we should dismiss everything he says as well. Now, I'm not saying we ought to do that. I'm just saying if you followed his logic, then if a person makes a factual error like this, then you should dismiss what they say. Again, it's not either or with external evidence and internal evidence. I've given seven arguments uh, that he's yet to refute from internal evidence for the book of Revelation and the external evidence. When you put both of those together, it's, a, I believe, a strong, if not an overwhelming case uh, for the traditional uh, Domitianic or the late date, AD, 5, AD 95 date uh, for Revelation. Now, Mr. Hanegraaff will answer Mark Hitchcock's question, no, which he has is a as follows. To, he has a minute to respond. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Hank, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just say that uh, very clearly, if uh, you were listening to me, I didn't suggest in any sense that we should dismiss what the church fathers say. Uh, what I'm saying is that the church fathers require interpretation. And I think that Irenaeus, uh, Eusebius, Victorinus, uh, Hegesippus, they all made substantial factual errors, or if you read them in a wooden literal sense, you're going to mistake their meaning. So they require interpretation. I'm not suggesting you can't uh, use them as evidence. I'm simply saying that you have to interpret the fathers, and I think that we are far better off then learning how to exegete the scriptures. Because Irenaeus, for example, in the prologue to my question, made an egregious error in suggesting that, that demons could have sex with women. Uh, if, if, if this is true, we learn, lose epistemic warrant for the central event in the Christian faith, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and vicariously lose uh, warrant for the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. So ideas have consequences. The ideas promoted by the church fathers had dramatic consequences. Okay, now here is uh, Mr. Hitchcock's question for Mr. Hanegraaff. External evidence plays an important role in dating the books of the New Testament. How do you explain the fact that Hecapus, Irenaeus, Victorinus, Eusebius, Jerome, Servetus and Primesius all support the AD 95 date and that no one prior to AD 500 explicitly supports the mid-60s Neuronic date of Revelation. I find it highly ironic that I would be asked this question by Dr. Hitchcock in that the pre-tribulational theory, which is at the heart of this debate, didn't surface until the 19th century. Now, this is not my opinion. Uh, Dr. Harry Ironside, who uh, Dr. LaHaye says is a hero of his, a uh, preaching hero of his, and justifiably so, says this. He says, search the so-called fathers, pre- and post-Nicene, the scholastic divines, the Roman Catholic writers of all shades of thought, the reformers, the Puritans, and they will find the mystery absence absent, uh, conspicuous by its absence. Uh, now, this was uh, a point that I think was pretty much conceded until Grant Jeffrey uh, spent 10 years combing the archives of history and came up with what he calls an electrifying discovery. Ephraim the Syrian, supposedly as a church father, believed in the pre-tribulational rapture. Now, it so turns out that that is absolutely false. And to his credit, Dr. LaHaye has conceded that point and now says that it wasn't Ephraim the Syrian, it was pseudo-Ephraim written in the sixth or seventh century. Uh, by the way, I'm not just making this up. Um, the fact of the matter is, the this is a point now conceded, even though people like uh, Norm Geisler still attribute pre-tribulational rapturism uh, with Ephraim the Syrian in the fourth century. Well, nothing could be farther from the truth, and even if it was true, there's no pre-tribulational rapture tradition that grew up around it. Uh, not only that, but if you read Pseudo-Ephraim, you will find out that Pseudo-Ephraim did not, uh, in any sense, teach a pre-tribulational rapture. Read his 10-point sermon. He doesn't do it. 
Uh, we do not have any writings, uh, for example, in which Hegesippus explicitly supports a late date for Revelation. Nor do we have any evidence that Eusebius believed that Hegesippus held to a late date. It's all just speculation on the part of Dr. Hitchcock. And there are many things better than speculation. Clement of Alexandria, for example, says Revelation ceased at the time of Nero. As such, the canon would have had to be completed during the reign of Nero. Now, maybe that's not explicit, it's at least implicit, and it's a whole lot better than speculation. That's it. Well, I thought you were giving me a... One uh, minute. Well, the, the only other thing I would add to this, and I think it's a significant point, and that is there are many traditions, and Dr. Hitchcock was kind enough to, to mention that, there were, there's not just two traditions in the early church with respect to the dating of the book of Revelation. Uh, there's at least four traditions. You have the uh, tradition of Claudius, written during the reign of Claudius, Nero, Domitian, and even Trajan. Much more could be said, but I'm out of time. How do I get up here? <laughs> First of all, about the pre-trib rapture, a pseudo-Ephraim refers to the pre-trib rapture. We still maintain that. Brother Dulcino in the 1300s held to a pre-trib rapture. Morgan Edwards, the founder of Brown University. Francis Gummerlock has told me personally that he has two file drawers full of pre-trib rapture statements that he's yet to uh, translate uh, from Latin. So there are a lot of historical antecedents to pre-trib rapture. Um, also, um, about uh, um, what about Irenaeus? You're talking about uh, Hegesippus and all this. Irenaeus makes a clear statement that the book of Revelation uh, was written near the end of the reign of Domitian. And the first person, you talk about these four traditions, Epiphanius mentions it under Claudius. That can't be true. The seven churches didn't even exist. We know that's wrong. One guy mentions under Trajan. And uh, the first evidence for the Neronic date is 508 AD. These are the witnesses for, or for the 65 date. These are the witnesses for the 95 date again. Now, Mr. Hanegraaff's second question to Mark Hitchcock. In sharp distinction to your contention that many New Testament epistles, including Revelation, were written long after AD 70, dispensational heavyweight Dr. Norman Geisler argues convincingly that most, if not all, the books of the New Testament canon must have been written prior to AD 70. Says Geisler, if you, quote, if you and your fellow followers write accounts of Jesus after the temple and the city are destroyed, aren't you going to at least mention that unprecedented tragedy somewhere in your writings, especially since this risen Jesus predicted it? Of course, unquote. Dr. Geisler, though a dispensationalist, I might add he's a member of the pre trib study group, recognizes that had Revelation been written after this apocalypse the Apostle John would have certainly have referenced it. Thus he cites Revelation 11 to underscore the fact that, quote, the New Testament documents speak of Jerusalem and the temple as if they were still intact at the time of the writings, unquote. Ironically, in your dissertation, you cite as the first of your reasons that John would not have mentioned the fulfillment of this most notable prophecy that, quote, in A.D. 95, 25 years after the fact, the destruction of the Jewish temple would have had little relevance for predominantly Gentile churches that were approximately 800 miles from Jerusalem, unquote. Yet, as you well know, the fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy concerning the destruction of the temple, like the resurrection of our Lord, has had enormous apologetic significance throughout church history. Indeed, alongside evidences for the resurrection, it is a primary apologetic for the deity of Christ. Why then do you argue that a prophetic uh, fulfillment that validates the essential Christian doctrine of the deity of Christ, quote, would have little relevance, unquote, for Gentile believers in Asia Minor, 
Well, I have uh, two responses to this question. First, Dr. Norman Geister, in a very negative review of Mr. Hanegraaff's book, The Apocalypse Code, has stated clearly these always held the revelation was written in AD 95. Dr. Geisler says, in particular, the code also takes the quote from our book out of context in an attempt to support their view by showing that I believe John was written before AD 70. I never said any such thing. I was merely emphasizing that most, if not all, of the New Testament was written early. I never said, nor do I believe, that John wrote Revelation before AD 70. I've held the late date for John's gospel and the apocalypse for the last 50 years. So, dispensational heavyweight Dr. Norman Geister disagrees with Mr. Hanegraaff's view of the date of the book of Revelation and apparently believes that he took his statements out of context to try to claim him for support for his view. And again, I'll leave that issue for you and Dr. Geisler to settle. Second, Mr. Hanegraaff continues to harp on this idea that if Revelation was written after A.D. 70, John would have been required to mention it. This is the gist of his first two towers in defense of the A.D. 65 date. There are three reasons why John made no mention of the events in A.D. 70 when he wrote the book of Revelation in A.D. 95. Revelation, again, was written to a primarily Gentile audience 25 years after A.D. 70, 800 miles from Jerusalem. This event would have had little relevance to them. Notice I said little relevance, not no relevance. Of course, the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70 has apologetic importance for the church. But Revelation, my second point is, is a prophecy, not an apologetics book or a history book. It defines itself that way in 1.3 and in 22.7 and 10. Revelation does not mention any fulfilled prophecies with a statement such as, this happened that it might be fulfilled. About 44 times John says, and I saw. John is being shown visions of the future, not the past. So the absence of any mention of A.D. 70 is easily explained. John is not at liberty to write what he wants to write. He's being told, write what you see. And what he's being shown is the future. So he's not at liberty to write about the past. He's being shown a vision of the future. And the book of Revelation, again, at both at the beginning and the end, kind of again these bookends, says it's a prophecy. And again, I know I've said this before, and, and uh, Mr. Hanegraaff has not answered it yet, in Revelation 1.19, John is commanded by Jesus, the glorified, resurrected Christ, to write the things you've seen. That's the vision he's just seen of the glorified Christ in Revelation 1. Write the things that are. I take that that's Revelation 2 and 3, the seven churches. And write the things that will take place after these things. If John would have written about the events of A.D. 70, which were 25 years in the past, he would have disobeyed the direct command of Jesus to write about the present and the future and not the past. That's why John uh, doesn't mention this. Certainly we're not saying that this event, of uh, Jesus' prediction of the destruction of Jerusalem, has no relevance. It has apologetic relevance. Certainly we use it today. But that's not the purpose um, of the book of Revelation. It's a prophecy. It's about the future, uh, the present and the future that John was writing. And so to me, that's a, a very easy thing to understand of why John would not have mentioned this. And for you to say, you know, it's inconceivable he wouldn't have mentioned it, to me it would be even inconceivable if he did mention it, because Jesus told him not to. Write what you've seen, write the things that are, write the things that will be after these things. That's the explanation uh, for why it's not there. Thank you. Okay, a minute. Mr. Hanegraaff has one minute response. Yes, you use the word inconceivable, which uh, you correctly quote me on, but you should be quoting yourself because your argument is with yourself. You said, and these are your words, certainly if Revelation was written two, three, or four years after the destruction of Jerusalem, it would be, and again your word, crazy not to mention it. Now, if John was not at liberty to write about the most apocalyptic event in, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in Jewish history, how could you make that statement? Not only that, but if you have in Revelation a recapitulation of major historical events, the fall in paradise, the Babylonian exile, slavery in Egypt, Sodom, Elijah shutting up the sky for three and a half years. Why would John fail to mention the most apocalyptic event in Jewish history? And why would true Israel in Gentile churches care about it less than we do today? Because we use it as an apologetic. In reality, the very church fathers you cite care about it so much that Eusebius cites it as proof of the gospel. Now, Mr. Hitchcock's 
second question to Mr. Hanegraaff. It's evident from Revelation 2, 8 through 11 that the church of Smyrna did, had existed for some time when John wrote Revelation. Polycarp was the bishop of Smyrna in the middle of the second century. In his letter to the Philippians written in about A.D. 110, Polycarp says that the Smyrnaeans did not know the Lord during the time Paul was ministering. Polycarp wrote, and I quote, But I have observed, but I have not observed or heard of any such thing among you, in whose midst the blessed Paul labored, and who were his letters of recommendation in the beginning. For he boasts about you and all the churches, those alone, that is, which at that time had come to know the Lord, for we had not yet come to know him." Unquote. If Revelation was written in A.D. 95, how do you, A.D. 65, how do you explain Polycarp's statement in his letter to the Philippians that the church of Smyrna did not even exist during the time of Paul's ministry, which continued until A.D. 67 or 68? I love Polycarp. He was uh, burned at the stake for failing to say Caesar is Lord. Uh, he said, 86 and, 80 and six years I've served him, and he has not failed me yet. How can I blaspheme my King and my Savior? But in answer to the question, first, there's no, no evidence in Revelation chapter 2 that the church at Smyrna had existed for some time, as in the, uh, the question itself, uh, when John wrote it, only that it did exist. Furthermore, all Polycarp is saying in this quotation is that the church at Smyrna did not come into existence until after Paul wrote his letter to the Philippians, in other words, uh, prior to uh, 62. Uh, thus the church would have been thriving by 65 and following. And finally, and I, th th this is the real point I'd like to make. The church grows westward from Jerusalem, so Smyrna, which is closer to Jerusalem than Rome and bears the moniker as the chief city in Asia, would certainly have had a significant constituency in the 60s. And if we again look at internal evidence from the Scripture and weigh Polycarp's statements in, in light of that evidence, we will find out that Acts tells us very clear that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord. And this is still around the time that Claudius is in power. Not only that, but Demetrius the silversmith, an unbeliever, argues that large numbers of people in practically the whole province of Asia were being led astray by Paul. Moreover, Paul himself may well have gone to Smyrna uh, personally on his way uh, to Troas. So the notion that the word returned void uh, in Smyrna uh, when all the Jews and Greeks uh, heard the gospel just seems incredible to me. Uh, the church is growing westward from Jerusalem. Uh, to, to suggest that the chief city in Asia didn't have a church uh, on the basis of a misunderstanding of Polycarp's statement uh, I, I think is unfortunate. Again, even if this is what Polycarp is saying, test Polycarp in light of Scripture. If you sit down with the book of Acts, you cannot come to this conclusion if indeed this was the conclusion by Polycarp. One minute. Yeah, again, Polycarp says, but I've not observed or heard of any such thing among you in whose midst the blessed Paul labored and who were his letters of recommendation. For he boasts about you in all the churches, those alone, that is, which at that time had come to know him, for we had not yet come to know him. And I think Polycarp, who's from that area, would have known uh, when the people there came to know him. As far as the Acts 19 statement goes, it says all who were in Asia heard the word, but it doesn't say there was a church in every city at that period of time. Some of the places may have gotten churches later. Um, it's, you're reading into the scripture there, it just says everybody who's in Asia heard uh, the word of God at that time. So when we look at the church of Smyrna, they're suffering persecution, there's blasphemy against them um, that's taking place, they're poor. There seems to be some history behind the church that would take more, and if they didn't exist in 62, we don't know whether they were founded in 62. It could have been 63, 64, they may have exist, existed for a very brief time.
Again, I think Polycarp is an excellent witness for this, and I don't think what he says uh, is at odds uh, with the Scripture. Again, this great man that you've mentioned in the early church, I think he knew when the church uh, there was founded. Now, Mr. Hanegraaff's third question to Mr. Hitchcock. In defense of your late dating revelation, you argue that the large-scale violent persecution of Christians under Nero cannot be primarily historical re cannot be the primary historical referent of revelation in your words quote there is almost universal agreement that nero's persecution never reached beyond the city of rome and its environs unquote once again however even a cursory perusal of the infallible scriptures reveal that early christians scattered throughout the roman empire suffered persecution for example before his death at the hands of the ne of Nero in AD 60s, Paul wrote to believers scattered throughout the Roman Empire, including those in Asia and in Bithynia, encouraging them to perseverance and holiness through the painful trials they were suffering. Additionally, there is strong biblical evidence that Jewish zealots persecuted Christians in many regions of the empire during the decades following Christ's resurrection. If you are willing to concede that persecution of Christians occurred under Domitian on the basis of scant and indirect historical illusions and in spite of credible scholarship which holds that no large-scale persecution occurred during Domitian's reign, shouldn't you also embrace the common sense notion that Christian persecution under Nero was not merely relegated to Rome but as the Bible makes plain, extended to Christians living in the center of a Caesar cult that demanded that both the empire, the emperor and the empire be worshiped as Lord and Savior. Um, I have uh, four points in answering this question. First, uh, the universal consensus among scholars, secular and Christian, is that the Neuronic persecution never extended beyond the city of Rome and its immediate environs, much less all the way to Asia. Here's some scholars that may mean something to some of you and not much to others. Uh, Leon Morris, Raymond Brown, Ben Witherington III, Vern Poitras, Greg Beale, Grant Osborne. This is an established historical fact that's conserved confirmed by both Christian and secular historians. Two, it is true that first, in 1 Peter that believers in Asia and Bithynia were experiencing slander, reviling, and being evil spoken of, which are the words that are used in the book of 1 Peter uh, by people in their culture. But there's no evidence in 1 Peter that this was organized, systematic persecution directed by Roman authorities. Apparently, it was simply the intermittent, localized slander that believers often had to endure from their pagan neighbors. Mr. Hanegraaff says the Bible makes plain that the persecution under Nero extended to Christians outside Rome. He bases this on 1 Peter, yet 1 Peter, 1, or 1 Peter 3, both verse 14 and verse 17, both contain a Greek fourth-class condition, which denotes something that is possible but improbable, something that is remote. These verses say, if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, if God should will that you suffer, um, that's like saying, uh, if it snows in Dallas on Easter. Possible, but very remote. So he's saying the Bible makes it plain, yet in this passage it's making, it, making the statement there that it's something that's possible, but very improbable. Mr. Hanegraaff, third of all, says there is strong biblical evidence that Jewish zealots persecuted Christians in many regions of the empire. This has nothing to do with the issue of whether Roman persecution under Nero reached outside the city of Rome. Jewish persecution and official Roman persecution are two completely different entities. They don't have anything to do with one another, I don't believe. Number four, I agree with Mr. Hanegraaff. Now, I know that comes a great surprise for me to say that in this debate, that I agree with him. But I agree with Mr. Hanegraaff that there was no empire-wide systematic persecution under Domitian. There wasn't under Nero either. However, there is historical evidence that Christians were martyred in the area near Asia in A.D. 92 during Domitian's reign. Pliny was a governor of Bithynia, and, or, or, and, and he wrote a letter to Trajan, who was the emperor, in 112. And then Trajan wrote a letter back to Pliny. These letters have to do with how, what they should do with Christians as they try them, should they execute them, how do they deal with Christians in their midst. And in his letter, Pliny notes that some believers were killed 20 years earlier after trials before the Roman authorities. Now, 20 years earlier from A.D. 112, when the letter of Pliny was written, was A.D. 92. 
during the reign of Domitian. So the letter of Pliny to Trajan is hard evidence that Christians were persecuted and executed as an official act of the Roman Empire in A.D. 92 under Domitian. No such evidence exists under Nero's reign. So again, I believe here that the evidence points toward uh, the A.D. 95 uh, date of Revelation. Would you not think that there was a widespread persecution of Christians throughout the Roman Empire under Nero, sit down on a quiet Sunday afternoon and, and reread the book of Acts? Or read 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 9, where Paul writes about how God has put apostles on display as men condemned to die in the arena. Nero demanded to be worshipped as both Savior and Lord, and anyone who failed to do that was to suffer the wrath of the empire. And as such, Paul himself was beaten with rods on three separate occasions by authorities of the empire outside of Rome. Mm -hmm. Not only that, in Jerusalem... The Jews cried out, anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. And for that, the Lord Jesus Christ himself was crucified. To say that there was no persecution... Go ahead and finish your sentence. To say that there was no uh, uh, persecution or there wasn't a widespread uh, uh, persecution under Nero does violence to the collective memories of Christians who were beaten, tarred and feathered, stoned, and lit ablaze to serve as nightly illumination for the games. Mr. Hitchcock's third question to Mr. Hanegraaff. The words soon, take us, and near, in gaze, occur strategically at the beginning and the end of Revelation serving as bookends or brackets for all the material in the book including Revelation 20 through 22. Uh, and he lists the verses uh, Revelation 1-1, 1-3, 2-26, 22-7, 22-9, 22-11, 22-13, 22-14, 22-15, 22-16, 22-17, 22-18, 22-19, 22-20, 22-21, 22-22, 22-23, 22-24, 22-25, 22-26, 
a soon coming apocalypse looming on the horizon and vindication for true Israel in the midst of that apocalypse is associated with vindication in the eschaton. Now, if that is how the Old Testament prophets speak, and most certainly it is uh, how the Old Testament prophets speak, there is no problem whatsoever for Jesus or John to speak in the manner of the Old Testament prophets. Once again, I think it's critically important for us uh, to spend our time learning to exegete Scripture rather than learning to exegete the fathers. If we compare Scripture with Scripture, uh, we would never have a problem with the notion that Jesus is talking about something that's coming soon. And again, uh, remember Revelation is the testimony of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. Soon means soon. And when Jesus Christ in the Olivet Discourse says, this generation will not pass away until all these things have been fulfilled, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away, he is not subject to contradiction. Uh, Exactly what he said happened within a generation. The temple was destroyed. And there's no warrant for arbitrarily suggesting that between Matthew chapter 2, 24, 2, and Matthew 24, uh, 4, uh, that suddenly there's a, tra- tra- a transition on the part of our, 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 our master and teacher, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's suddenly talking about a third temple. Uh, this isn't exegesis, with all due respect to you, Thomas Ice, it's uh, eisegesis. One minute. Let me grab this right here. Hold on one second. Let me grab this here. Uh, yeah, Mr. Hanegraaff insists that near and soon mean within a few years. He says, Revelation not only predicted four future events, such as the coming apocalypse in John's lifetime, but also chronicles events that will take place in the far and final future. For one day the Lord Himself will come down from heaven. The dwelling of God will forever be with men. Each person will be resurrected and judged according to what He's done. The problem of sin will be fully and finally resolved. Since, again, the timing terms occur strategically at the beginning and the end of Revelation, whatever meaning one gives to soon and near must explain the timing of all the events in the book. To be consistent, you have to be a full preterist, that is to take all the events of Revelation past, or be a futurist. And I know Mr. Anagraph says that he's not a partial preterist, but I mean, I think it would at least be fair to say he takes Revelation 1 to 19 preteristically, which means past, that they've already uh, taken place. No, I don't. So the strategic location of these timing terms, again, to me, indicates someone is either going to have to be a, a futurist or they're going to have to be a full preterist. You can't change the meaning of these terms in midstream.